Why do some people refuse to change their minds, despite overwhelming evidence against their beliefs? There is at least one obstacle we encounter every day which impedes our progress in life. The fear of the unknown. The absence of even a small amount of information can be enough to subvert personal freedom to explore new places and try new things. We seem to be free as far as we can see. We can feel free and comfortable with only the choices we know. But there are many choices we don't know that are much better for us, but not better for those who control us. We all live in private bubbles of limited perception. Most of us stick close to our towns, neighborhoods, and homes, stay in the family business, follow comfortably along in our parents' footsteps, follow the examples of close friends we made as children. We rely on those with whom we bonded as children for our bread, butter, and beliefs. We assume that our way of life is right because we are accustomed to it. If we stay within our social bubbles, we develop the same kind of fear that prevented Europeans from sailing across the Atlantic for centuries after they had ships large enough to make the trip. As children, we accept without question the word of our parents and authority figures that rule over us in strictly controlled environments. Children accept any claim as true, including the existence of supernatural beings that can watch their every move and know their every thought. Eventually, children develop a subconscious sense that they are being watched, even when alone, called a sense of internal authority, which can carry over into adulthood. As children, we have no choice but to defer authority to our parents. Out of this natural state of living, we transpose the family hierarchy onto our external society because it feels comfortable and easy to rely on others to make decisions for us. We need not think much. Barriers of the unknown. A lack of pioneering spirit. It's rare to have willpower enough to explore beyond familiar territory, to take the steps from employee to entrepreneur, to explore the perspective of an opposing political ideology. Obedience. It's easier to do what we are told than it is to use what we are taught. Emotionally consistent survival response. We respond similarly to a stranger, an unknown door, unknown course of study, an unfamiliar street, mysterious path in the forest, or unknown substance on the ground, with an adrenaline fight-or-flight response. Social conditioning by the mass media. We are conditioned to expect the worst possible outcome of any unknown situation by films, television, and other forms of broadcast media. The continuous news coverage of violence, social depravity, and corruption, along with the wildly speculative and melodramatic exaggeration of behavior in fictional stories, has insinuated into our subconscious minds a general anxiety about the world outside of our front doors. <laughs> Risk aversion has become pandemic. The ruling class has engineered our way of life, so we only know enough to work for our basic needs. Like the frog in a pot of slowly boiling water, we are becoming accustomed to gradually worsening living conditions. A fundamental flaw in our education, in and out of school, is creating gaps in early childhood learning that later manifest as a refusal to accept new information or to change one's mind. Jean Piaget, through his research, categorized four stages of cognitive development. His research found a series of specific behavioral milestones in a child's ability to solve certain problems. It's easy to assume that because an infant does not give direct articulate feedback in its first two years, that speaking to a child in a normal adult voice is unnecessary, but this couldn't be further from the truth. This is only a partial summary of the differences in each stage of development. The important point is the inexplicable problem that seems to occur between the concrete operational stage and the formal operational stage. For many people, 
Certain aspects of formal operational thinking do not develop. Other people don't make the transition from concrete operational to formal operational thinking. They only see their own goals and immediate needs, regardless of the outcome for the community affected by their decisions. They only understand people who share identical experiences or circumstances. They seek affiliation based only on the same physical traits, traditions, and social expectations. They are reactive to negative outcomes instead of proactive to potential negative outcomes. They cannot see the true limits and consequences of consuming resources such as oil, coal, and natural gas. They ignore long-term consequences of their actions. They often succumb to impulsive behavior, unable to recognize what triggered it, lashing out in a rage at everything or anyone nearby. They are easily influenced by emotions that are triggered by images, places, or rituals. They are easily entertained, distracted from those who manipulate them, often not finishing what they start. They see payroll only as an expense instead of a long-term investment in economic and social externalities. They have a self-ascribed sense of entitlement, egocentric, value flash over substance, measure social class status by tiny differences of income, as little as $2 per hour wage difference, often vindictive due to their frustration, seeking every opportunity to exert power over others to regain a false sense of control over their own lives, gossiping, bullying, and abusive, often making jokes at the expense of others and manipulating their friends. But they are good at following instructions without question. Concrete operational thinkers resolutely stand by their age-old principles, despite being completely out of touch with the current state of the economy and scientific discovery. Many concrete operational thinkers can be accountants, pharmacists, or have any career with a clear fixed set of ideas, instructions, or parameters that do not change. They can be literate and articulate, but literacy without critical thinking just makes more efficient slaves, peasants, minions, and mercenaries. Formal operational thinkers are independent, skeptical, and inquisitive. Never take any information on its face value. Always verify claims with multiple sources, including ideologically opposing sources, and sources not directly affected by the given situation. They reserve judgment until all the facts are in. They recognize the difference between constructive criticism and abusive vitriolic hyperbole. They make an effort to keep up with current events and policies so they know how to make a difference in society. They reject and discard notions, ideas, or beliefs that have no evidence or tangible benefit to themselves or anyone else. What makes them so special? The threshold between concrete operational and formal operational thinking is apparently so large that ideology and dogma dominate our culture at the expense of untold human suffering and death. Early childhood development may hold the key to building a solid foundation for reason in adulthood. From first thing in the morning to last thing at night, children are absorbing the words that they hear around them and learning about their world. The experience is an important one. The number of words a child hears in its early years will determine their academic success and IQ later in life. But some children do not hear as many words spoken as others. By the age of three, children born into poor families will have heard 30 million fewer words than those from wealthier ones. One reason for this word gap is that parents of high socioeconomic status interact with their children more. And this is why three and four year olds, like these children at a Chicago fee paying nursery, can reach school age as much as two years ahead of others. Once established, this difference may even grow. New research presented at the American Association for the Advancement of Science shows that the word gap can even be seen in the brain. 
Kim Noble from Columbia University in New York has found that children from higher income backgrounds have larger brain volumes in areas that support language. Here in uh, this figure, we have highlighted two areas of the brain that support different aspects of language processing. Uh, very broadly, the dark blue area, or the left inferior frontal gyrus, um, largely supports language expression, whereas the light blue area, or the left superior temporal gyrus, largely supports language understanding. Of course, um, all children's brains grow as they get older. Um, these areas are no exception, but what we found was that among higher SES children, at older ages, relatively more neural real estate was dedicated to these regions relative to other regions in the brain and relative to children from lower socioeconomic families. Many think the solution is to make preschool more widely available in America. But researchers at the American Association for the Advancement of Science say that the word gap begins far earlier than this. This achievement gap uh, begins really early. Uh, we have evidence as young as 18 months and uh, that, that there's a, a, I mean, a big difference between children in low SES, socioeconomic status families and high SES families. And these gaps don't disappear. If anything, they may get a little wider or, or pretty much stay constant, but they're there much earlier than, than we had thought. Dana Suskund runs the 30 Million Words Initiative in Chicago. Her project is teaching parents the best ways of talking to children. I think the policy implications are simple. If we truly want to make a difference, preschool is too late. If we really want to make a difference, we need to go where it begins, between zero and three, and in the home. So it is really through the power of parent talk that true change can occur. The research is clear. The impact of children's early language environments have an indelible impact on children. It is, in fact, the beginning of the achievement gap as we know it. This device is a word pedometer. Attached to a child, it measures how many words a child hears every day. Researchers use it to measure what is happening in the home, but data from Lena has turned out to be invaluable to parents who are trying to improve their child's cognitive development. Sitting in front of a TV, though, does not work. Children have to have stories read to them and to be engaged in conversation, even if they're not speaking back. We get the device and the shirt back from the family, and then we just hook it up to the computer. And after a few hours of uploading the data, uh, it generates this report where we can actually see um, based on the day, hour, or minute, um, exactly how many words the child hears and says. By the ages of eight to nine, 81 percent of children from low-income families in America do not have age-appropriate cognitive skills, a deficit that can be traced back to the words they heard in their early years. The benefits of something so simple as talking to young children and exposing them to rich language are enormous because by the time children reach the age of five, their brains have already done most of their growing. A boost in parent talk, scaled up across America, could start to erase the differences that are a major contribution to low levels of academic performance. Spending money to erase the achievement gap will pay off later in lower costs of social welfare, higher tax revenues and economic growth. One, two, three. Most important of all though, every child will have a real chance to reach their full potential. The Economist. What if I was raised in a sheltered community with limited access to information? I know something is not right with my life, but I just don't know how to see it. You can begin by following a few pointers by Bertrand Russell. Do not feel absolutely certain about anything. Do not think it worthwhile to produce belief by concealing evidence, for the evidence is sure to come to light. Never try to discourage thinking, for you are sure to succeed. When you meet with opposition, even if it's from your family, endeavor to overcome it with argument and not by authority. For a victory dependent upon authority is unreal 
and illusory. Have no respect for the authority of others, for there are always contrary authorities to be found. Do not use power to suppress opinions you think pernicious, for if you do, the opinions will suppress you. Do not fear to be eccentric in opinion, for every opinion now accepted was once eccentric. Find more pleasure in intelligent dissent than in passive agreement, for if you value intelligence as you should, the former implies a deeper agreement than the latter. Be scrupulously truthful, even if the truth is inconvenient, for it is more inconvenient when you try to conceal it. Do not feel envious of the happiness of those who live in a fool's paradise, for only a fool will think that is happiness. Having a basic understanding of psychology is a good start. Understanding behavior can open doors you couldn't imagine before. You can begin to recognize forms of social manipulation, such as group or cult influences, also known as groupthink. Escape the darkness of ignorance. Learn critical thinking skills. Start with Robert's Rules of Order. Argumentation and Debate by Austin J. Freely and David L. Steinberg. Or Introduction to Logic by Patrick Subs. You can start by focusing on logical fallacies. Learning about the types of arguments and getting into forms of logic can be confusing, so the best way I found to get started is with examples of errors in reasoning. I'm going to move quickly through the next few slides because I don't want to distract from the main point of this presentation. There are main categories of logical fallacies, relevance, ambiguity, and presumptions. Many of these types of arguments can overlap under different circumstances. There are far too few rational thinkers in our civilization. They are capable of solving our problems by focusing on reality and the inconvenient truths avoided by everyone else. Unfortunately, concrete operational thinkers are so set in their ways that they cannot be won over with any arguments. Adult formal operational thinkers cannot reason with adult concrete operational thinkers. Concrete operational thinkers dominate our culture because they are ideally suitable as slaves, peasants, minions, and mercenaries for the ruling elite. Formal operational thinkers are often vilified as nerds, geeks, or other epithets, and are often denied a fair balance of funding in college science programs compared to sports programs. Formal operational thinkers must cease enabling adult concrete operational culture, which is destroying our world. Our world cannot sustain ignorance. Here are some sources. You can pause the video to write them down.